Why Jerusalem? And why do people call it the Holy City? We will examine these questions and more in this new season of Israel, the Prophetic Connection. Our focus this time, Jerusalem, the Eternal City. As the sun rises higher in the sky, over the Mount of Olives where I'm standing, she casts her rays on the golden, beautiful city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem means peace, but what a turbulent history this holy city has had. In the year AD 70, the Romans destroyed the city completely, and with it, the temple that stood on the Temple Mount behind me. In the seventh century AD, the armies of the Muslims came here and they captured the city. And in the distance, you can see the Golden Dome of the Rock. And just to the, over my right shoulder, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Two symbols of Islam and of the fact that they were here and also conquered the city. Around 1517, the Ottoman Turks captured Jerusalem. And their empire controlled this land for 400 years, ending in 1917 with the British army under General Allenby rode in triumph into the city and relieved it of its occupation back in 1917. This city stands at the crossroads of continents. That's why it was so strategic, and that's why the nations always fought over it, and it was a tug of war down through history over Jerusalem. But none of these conquering nations ever claimed Jerusalem as their capital city. She was and remains until this day, the capital of only one nation in history, and that nation is Israel. But why? Today, in the opening decades of the 21st century, Jerusalem has become the focus of the nations, but why? What is it about this 4,000 year old city that has captured the attention of world leaders who argue that it should be divided or alternatively internationalized for the benefit of all peoples. For me, Jerusalem is the heart. It, it's the heartland. That's a great word, heartland. You know, people use the word heartland. Well, if there's a heartland in this world, it's Jerusalem. Obviously, it's the capital of Israel. It's the capital of modern day Israel, but it's also the heartland of the yearnings of the Jewish people for the last 2000 years since we were evicted from this land. Uh, God was not happy with us. The Romans came and, and kicked us out, and now we're coming back. At the same time, there's another meaning for that word heartland. It's also the heartland for all humanity. This is where all the prayers around the world come in. When you pray to God, it goes up, and then it takes a right or a left, and it travels to Jerusalem, it travels to that Temple Mount over there, and it goes up to God. This is the communication hub for spirituality between heaven and earth. The Bible has more than 800 references to Jerusalem. 3,000 years ago, King David, Israel's second king was directed by God to choose Jerusalem as the capital city of his kingdom. But this newly formed United Kingdom of Israel was to be ruled by God's laws with Jerusalem at its center. Well, Israel was chosen by God to be an example uh, for all time of his kingdom. And it was God's intention from the beginning that he would rule Israel as king. And he reveals uh, through his prophet Moses that he uh, intends and chooses to rule in a lawful way. Um, however, in modern times, Israel has, has been reestablished as a nation, and of course, uh, we're reestablished as a democratic nation. But that doesn't mean that God has changed his desire to uh, have this nation be an example of his kingdom. And we're seeing that through the introduction of, uh, the, rather, the restoration of messianic faith to the Jewish people and to the people of Israel, that there is this establishment, once again, of God's kingdom in the hearts of people and an obedience to his laws of the spirit. Uh, first of all, laws that set us free to obey him fully and from, from our hearts and uh, with all of our strength and all of our, our will and all of our mind. 
But these laws now have to work through the people of Israel to bring about uh, a change in the, in the culture and in the way the nation operates. But can an earthly kingdom based upon God's righteous laws be properly ruled by mortal men? Governments have to do a lot of things. They have to mostly take care of their citizens, keep them safe, and throw out the garbage, okay? Democracy is a great system for that. It lets you know when there's a problem in different parts of the country, people speak up, and the government hears it. It's a very useful way of doing business in terms of governance. Theocracy means that we're related to God. We hear his laws, we hear his ideas, we hear his spirit. Israel is a combination of those things. On the one hand, it's a modern country with a modern army and modern sewage and buses and all the things that you need in order to run a real flesh and blood country. But on the other hand, like on the Sabbath, like on the seventh year that we keep fallow, uh, like on the Jubilee, uh, like on the three festivals, we have cultural ideas, spiritual ideas that need that what you call theocracy. What many people forget in the debate over the status of Jerusalem is that this holiest of cities has no parallel on earth. The Bible declares that Jerusalem was chosen by God as the capital city of an earthly kingdom, but this was to be a kingdom governed by heaven's laws. In other words, a theocracy. Jerusalem was to be the capital of a spiritual nation that would reflect God's righteous rule in all matters of human existence. Obviously, it also has tremendous spiritual implications when you try to divide away the Temple Mount from the Jewish people. Uh, when you make a, a racially divided city, that's just not a loving city. See, Jerusalem is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. It's supposed to be a place that unites and not divides. So the ideas of division are regressive, retrograde, and need to kind of pass by the wayside. When you talk about, about a big, united, strong city that encompasses all of its inhabitants. In other words, while Jerusalem may have a diverse population, it must be governed according to the standards of the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Personally, I believe that God will rule Israel completely and you'll have something like a theocracy when he returns. And up until that time, God is ruling through the hearts of people and through the political systems of our day uh, to bring about justice, to bring about righteousness and peace in society through the organs of society. God's working through society today by establishing his kingdom in our hearts. But I believe the day is coming when God himself will come to the new Jerusalem and will rule not only Israel, but all nations uh, personally. And I believe then you, we can begin to talk about theocracy. Really, at the end of the day, it's what the people really want. The people do want to come back to Judaism. They want to come back to the Bible. And so this is their opportunity to do it in a modern state. So on the one hand, we got to have business as usual. We got to have the buses running. We got to get that garbage taken out. On the other hand, we have a bigger goal. So somehow those things have to be fused. How exactly is it going to work out? We'll see. We believe that King David's descendant is going to come back, that there's going to be a Messiah, there's going to be a temple in Jerusalem. How exactly is that going to work? We'll have to see. It's going to, it's going to be exciting times. But the hybrid of a real country and the great destiny and goal of messianic times has to work together. As the prophetic clock ticks down toward the coming of Israel's Messiah and the establishment of his messianic kingdom on earth, it isn't difficult to see that Jerusalem will continue to be a cauldron of conflict, especially when the desires of men and nations clash with God's will and purposes for Jerusalem and Israel. Israel is the center of God's universe, and Jerusalem is the center of that center, then the Temple Mount, which is directly behind me, is the very heart of the things God loves. I'm standing on the Temple Steps. These are the steps that the pilgrims would have used as they ascended up onto the Temple uh, Mount above and walked through the colonnades toward the glorious Temple that stood up there. Uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, the Second Temple period, and then a thousand years before that, the Temple of King Solomon stood there. It was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. 
before Christ, and then the second temple that King Herod refurbished was destroyed by the Romans in the year AD 70. Now there are no temples up there, and yet it remains to this day the Temple Mount. Just up in the corner behind me, you can see an archway, and that presumably was one of the entrance doors onto the Temple Mount. We know that Jesus must have walked this way because people entered the temple on these steps. Now I'm standing on an original step, but some of the other steps have been fixed and replaced of necessity, but many of the original steps are here. So Jesus and his disciples came this way, entering the temple, and it's very probable that Jesus sat on these steps and taught his disciples and the rest of the people. But how did the temple get there in the first place? We read in the book of 2 Samuel in chapter 7, beginning in verse 12. David is at a very advanced age and near death, and we read these words. Nathan the prophet speaks to David and he says to him, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. David was forbidden from building the temple because he was a warrior king with blood in his hands. But it would fall to his, one of his sons, in fact, Solomon his son, he would build the temple. But David would make the preparations. He would raise the funds and organize the materials for the preparation so that Solomon his son could build the temple. And then we read in verse 14, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, meaning the first king of Israel who sinned against God, whom I removed from before you. And your house, and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is a covenant that God made with King David that his dynasty would be eternal. And of course, we know that through one of his descendants, Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal dynasty carries on. So we read on from there. And now Solomon, who's inexperienced, uh, has a, an incredible task on his hand. How will he build a house suitable for God into which the Ark of the Covenant can be brought and given a permanent home? Well, Solomon had natural wisdom because he could ask of God the right questions, but then God gave him godly or heavenly wisdom. And here we read in 1 Kings, in chapter 3 and verse 6. And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is, this day. Now hear the humility in Solomon's prayer and plea. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Well, we're told in this passage that his plea, his prayer, pleased the Lord. And because he had asked, he didn't ask for riches, he asked for the wisdom and the understanding to govern God's people, Israel. And because he asked for that, here's what God says in verse 12. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there is, has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And it goes on from there. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 29, And God 
gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largest of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. And it continues, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And people came from all over, it says, in verse 34, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And then we go on, and Solomon sets about building the house to the glory of God. And we read in chapter 9 of 1 Kings, and it came to pass... When Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built. And listen to these words, the words of Almighty God to Solomon the king. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. So as I stand this morning on the entrance steps to the Temple Mount and what was the temple itself 2,000 years ago and Solomon's temple 3,000 years ago, I'm standing in the very place, the place, the only place on earth God said he would place his name. Certainly at Jerusalem, more than likely at the Temple Mount and probably the temple site itself and maybe even the Holy of Holies. And God said, promised Sol Solomon, my eyes will be there perpetually. So today, God is watching over Jerusalem and he's watching over the Holy Site just beyond the walls of the Holy City. And Solomon built that house to the glory of God. Now, his fame reached the ends of the known world. And when we move into chapter 10, we read these words. Now the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. I like to call her the African queen because Sheba was in the region of what today is Ethiopia and Eritrea. But Sheba was a larger kingdom than those two countries put together. It covered a lot of East Africa. So the queen of Sheba, the African queen, traveled a very long way just to meet Solomon and to ask questions of him having heard of his wisdom and the splendor of, it, of his kingdom in those days. Verse 4, And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the servants, service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord. Perhaps, I mean, there were several ways to go to the temple, but we may well be standing on the entryway because this obviously was a grand entranceway capable of accommodating thousands of people at one time. And perhaps the Queen of Sheba ascended these very steps herself. And when she saw all of that, um, it says in the scripture there was no more spirit in her. I think she was so emotionally, spiritually overwhelmed. She was at a loss for words. And then, verse 6, then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. And then she says, happy are your men and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. And this incredible profession of faith on the lips of the queen of Sheba. In verse 9, Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore he made you king to do justice and righteousness. 
Well, we know from biblical history that after this, Solomon, he made errors in judgment. He multiplied to himself wives and concubines. These were violations of the commandments of God. And the kingdom was taken from him. In fact, it was divided in the days of his son between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The kingdom, the grand kingdom of Solomon fell apart. But remember what God had earlier said to David, yours will be an eternal dynasty. Well, as we look at the ruins of Jerusalem today, and we realize there is no longer a temple on the Temple Mount, we have to look to the words of the other prophets. And we have to realize that there was a descendant in David's line who came and who also, like David, was born in Bethlehem, not far from here. His name was Jesus of Nazareth because he was raised in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. He is the king who rightfully can ascend the throne of David. And one of these days, he'll be here again. And perhaps again, he'll walk on these ancient steps onto the Temple Mount. And a glorious new kingdom will begin when Jesus of Nazareth returns to the holy city that his father loves and where he has placed his name forever. Perched high on the hill behind me, and currently under renovation, is the Israeli parliament, better known as the Knesset, a symbol of the only democracy in the Middle East, because Israel as a democracy is surrounded by dictatorships. But in fact, Israel is a unique nation called into being by God when he called the man Abram, who became Abraham. And God, in fact, never intended Israel would simply be a democracy, but rather that this nation would be a theocracy, which means a nation under God, governed under God's laws. Now, ironically, this is the Jewish Sabbath, Saturday. There's very little traffic. There is some, but very little traffic. Many, in fact, probably most Jewish people in Jerusalem have parked their vehicles, and they will walk a short distance to get to the synagogue. But while there's some traffic, most Jews are honoring the Sabbath. They have parked their vehicles. So in a sense, today at least, Israel is as a theocracy. She's functioning under the laws of Almighty God. Listen to these words when Moses was called to go to Pharaoh and command that the children of Israel be allowed to leave Egypt. He asked God, he said, what shall I tell Pharaoh? And God said, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed I will kill your son, your firstborn. And of course, because the Pharaoh refused to let the people of Israel leave Egypt, God brought upon them 10 plagues. And the last plague was the worst of all, for it claimed the firstborn in the house of the Pharaoh and the firstborn of all living things in the land of Egypt. God meant business with Egypt, and when they refused to listen to him, then they brought the judgment upon themselves. But there are other scriptures that we can look at, and this, this one in, the, in Psalm 121, which speaks of the special relationship God has with this nation. In verse four of Psalm 121, behold, he who keeps Israel, speaking of the Lord God Almighty, shall neither slumber nor sleep. So that's a word on the lips of the psalmist which tells us God has a very special relationship with Israel. He looks upon Israel as his firstborn son and like a concerned parent, watches over Israel night and day.